so those things we saw today we will uh, start with a uh, uh, discussion on the how uh, uh, attacks can be uh, mounted on the systems so in particular we will try to understand what is the malicious software and uh, what is the implication of uh, those malicious softwares on the security so what they can actually do and then in particular we will see uh, a class of attacks called as the DAD denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks and then we will briefly discuss about the boat nets. These are uh, boat nets are also a class of the malicious uh, software. So that's the uh, agenda for today. So we will begin with asking a question what is actually a malicious uh, software? Uh, what kind of the uh, software we call it as the malicious one. The uh, malicious software is the one which actually does in simple terms uh, some malicious things on the uh, on in the system or in your network. It could be anything stealing your passwords might be on malicious things or deleting some files is a malicious thing. So similar things if the software does, the application does, then that kind of the software is called as the malicious software. So this malicious software is actually a, uh, in short uh, is also called as the malware. So malware is a very broad uh, uh, term. So anytime any application does something malicious, then that is called as the malware. So the, the example that I just gave. These are called the malicious actions that the software can take or do. So there are different types of the malwares depending upon how exactly they work and uh, what kind of the applications they target, what is the implication of those uh, malicious actions. So one of the prominent method of uh, uh, infecting the machine is something called as the virus. What is a virus? This is a computer virus. Uh, although the name, although we in the other uh, in our day to day life, we might have heard the term virus, that is a different virus. This is a computer virus. So, although the, the name itself comes from inherited from that uh, biological uh, means, so that virus also replicates. This computer virus also has the feature of replicating itself. So, one becomes two. So, one computer from the one computer, it can to the other computer from one application to the other applications, it can uh, uh, insert itself and then uh, runs. So one of the feature of this virus is it cannot run independently on its own. So it requires something called as a host just like uh, the virus that we see in daily life. Uh, so that only when it enters the body of a human being or any other animal, it can replicate, it can do, it can cause the damage. So it requires that environment. Similarly, this virus, computer virus also requires some kind of the host program or the application. So it goes and sits inside that host program or application and then it does the damage. That is why the name. The second category of the malicious software is called as the worm. So unlike the previous case, previous malicious software which is a virus, this worm can run on its own. So it can does the damage on its own. So it is an independent program. So the previous program virus requires some other program to run it. I will come, come and discuss that in little detail but you understand this difference. The virus is an independent program. It can run once I write the code. I can release it and then as an application it can go and then it can run on the target uh, computer. The third kind of the malicious software can come in the form of something called as the key loggers. What these key loggers do? So when I write something, so the uh, maybe on a form I am entering the username and the password. So that time the keystrokes that I have done on the uh, keyboard are captured and then they are written into a file and then exported to some remote location. So this is another form of the uh, malicious software. There are uh, programs which can actually do this. And another kind of the malware or malicious software that you can see or often discussed is something called as a spyware. What it does, it spies. So the previous example, keylogger is also 
in some sense uh, a kind of the spyware because it is spying the keystrokes that I am entering on the, uh, on, on the keyboard. So this spyware can also do some other things. Maybe uh, when I am browsing the internet, it can actually capture the browsing history and then send it to someone else. So that sit, someone else sitting elsewhere can find out what I am actually browsing on the internet. That is the, uh, the spyware. It can uh, snip, it can capture the passwords, it can capture the browsing history, it can capture anything or the some other format, what applications are running. Uh, what is the usage uh, uh, of the disk, uh, uh, CPU and all these kind of things can, can capture. That can give some hint to the other uh, attackers who actually uh, return the such kind of the softwares. So primarily this disk usage and CPU are not done, but the uh, browsing history or the capturing, uh, stealing the password are very common applications of the uh, spyware. And then the category of the malware is called something called as the ransomware. So in the media and all you might have heard this term quite often. Uh, ransomware is that malicious software which actually uh, locks the files on the computer. So maybe it can encrypt the file and then only when you uh, pay so and so amount of the money then we will release the car. Uh, uh, unlock those files or decrypt those files and then only you will be able to access them. So a malware comes into your system, sits on that in your computer and then maybe it can encrypt all the files with the key controlled by someone else. Only when you pay the money to the owners of that ransomware, then they will decrypt the files on your computer. So if the files that you have stored are very critical operations, so unless you pay the money, they not less. So you are uh, in some kind of uh, hostage uh, situation. So unless you uh, pay that, the things will not be released. So this is called the uh, ransomware. So these are all kinds, common type of the malware that you find. So this malware attack, uh, malicious software, malicious software is a very broad term that can be launched by an external entity or sometimes it can be done by an insider. So we will start the discussion with uh, uh, what kind of the uh, malware malicious software can be uh, written and launched by an insider and what kind of the uh, malwares can be launched by the outsiders. So uh, insider, uh, uh, now the question is who is the insider, whom we call the uh, adder. So this is uh, again uh, very defined. So the, the insider is the one who is part of the some kind of the development of let's say uh, 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 you are a programmer and you are part of some project XYZ project and you are develop, writing code for that XYZ project and uh, uh, you have some malicious intent and by virtue of that intent if you are uh, inserting some piece of the code or uh, deliberately writing something which is which exposes or puts the application at risk, then such kind of the attacks are called as the insider attacks. So someone who is part of the group itself is doing or writing something which is malicious in nature. Those attacks are called as the malicious attacks. So this malicious insider attack can come either part of the operating system. So your operating system that you install on your computer itself has some malicious code or it can come at a later stage where when you deploy some application on your computer. So when that application runs uh, on top of the OS, then uh, that application can be vulnerable. Uh, the logic of that application can be having some malicious intent. So that and also the uh, insider attacks can be launched. So either way, either it, is, it comes as a part of the OS or it can come as part of the an application running in your computer. So now the question is what kind of the insider attacks can be written or launched by a malicious user. So one of the prominent type of the insider attack is something called as the backdoor. So what is this backdoor? Backdoor is that feature of an application which gives 
कंट्रोल एक काइंड ऑफ नॉन नॉन कन्वेंशनल कंट्रोल ओवर दी एप्लीकेशन सो लेट्स टेक एन एग्जांपल लेट्स से आई हैव एक फार्म दिस इज मे बी कैन थिंक ऑफ इट एज अ वेब फार्म सो इन दिस फार्म यू हैव टू थिंग्स वन इज वेयर यू एंटर दी यूजर नेम एंड देन द सेकंड प्लेस where you enter the password so and then you have something or click button or submit button so when i uh, when any user when this form is exposed to the internal maybe i write a okay, username uh, username 1 and then the password is my password is let's say xyz when i click on is click so it is supposed to give me uh, this login page since uh, the authentication is done it will take me to some uh, uh, application i can tell maybe the banking application is there i provide my username and password when i submit this so the uh, my bank account details should come on the page this is the conventional way when when a user logs into the system but uh, a back door can be Uh, maybe something like this so let's say uh, a particular username not the username one maybe username uh, username 10 is there so this is a name 10 and a particular password xyz maybe uh, in addition to that maybe abc this is a particular password so this particular username and this particular password when i enter instead of giving or uh, giving access to the uh, my account details maybe an admin panel get opens so this particular very unique username and the unique password is known to the only the application developer who wrote the programmer uh, who develop who wrote the code for uh, uh, this application so every time uh, although uh, today might be part of this project tomorrow if he leaves the company goes somewhere and then since he has developed this application and he can uh, he can use this username and then this particular password and gain the uh, admin access to this banking application so this is not desired so if any application which is having this kind of the malicious intent and it is written with this malicious intent by some programmer or the developer application developer and if it bypasses the security testing so the testers are supposed to identify such bugs but even then sometimes it becomes uh, uh, either overlooked or it is uh, difficult to identify such uh, particularly if you have a large code base so if that happens then this such kind of the logic can go into the application so is are called this uh, he, he the application developer has a back door entry to that application that is what we call it as the back door so uh, such kind of the uh, attacks are called as back door uh, attacks so where the application developer an insider has put some logic inside the application which gives him or the privileges so uh, sometimes uh, this backdoor the term itself although it is used in the negative sense so uh, sometimes deliberately also for, for some useful reason uh, these such backdoors are uh, left uh, open in the inside the uh, application so i'll just give an example so for example uh, if uh, let's say the authentication system is using the biometric my thumb impression on the uh, on a particular my so if i give my impression it is giving me some uh, access so for some reason uh, if my thumb is damaged and i am not able to provide the uh, right impression the system is able uh, not able to capture my uh, fingerprint so that time uh, the i may not be able to get access to the system in that case what should i do so i might contact some customer care and then ask so and so thing happened so uh, why don't you uh, uh, do something to get access so they might have some uh, special privileges where by asking some questions to be they can open up the application and then the application may be made available 
So, although uh, in true sense, I am required to provide the uh, biometric uh, authentication, but uh, since something happened uh, and I am not able to provide that uh, biometric access, so uh, the system can actually uh, such using such backdoors, the uh, system administrators or the other people who have got the right privileges can actually bypass that security requirement and then give the access. So, those are also called as the backward, but this is not the illegitimate use case. Uh, so, in true sense, uh, this is one use case, but in general, this is also called as the backdoor. So, this backdoor has got both uh, legitimate and illegitimate to use cases. The other type of the insider attack that uh, is something called as the logic bomb. So, let us again go back to the same example, if you are a programmer application developer and then uh, you insert some piece of the code, some logic inside that program which actually does something it says when some trigger condition is satisfied, maybe that trigger condition can be anything, some particular user has logged in or when you log in with particular uh, uh, as word. Well, or uh, some particular day, uh, some particular uh, application is open, whatever it might be. So, that uh, uh, is as act as a trigger point. Once that trigger point is uh, met, then the logic of that program, whatever the malicious thing that you have written is actually executed. So, in some sense, the program is actually until that trigger point appears, it is sitting silently and only when that trigger point matched, it is actually uh, does some malicious things on the uh, system. So, if you take an example, it might look something like this. So, I have uh, a large program. So, in that large program, let us say this is my uh, in program and I have some legitimate code at the beginning and then I have some condition that is supposed to be checked. Here is my uh, condition that trigger point and then what if this trigger point is met then there is something malicious should happen that is the, the malicious code and then I might have other legitimate things on this. So, uh, some legitimate code at the beginning and some legitimate code at the end and in between this uh, trigger condition verification code and then some malicious uh, sections. So, if you look at this, the program might look like this. So, at the beginning we have some legitimate code, at the end I have some legitimate code, only this portion where uh, I have written the code for uh, the trigger point and also what accent to be taken if that trigger point is met satisfied. So, that there. So, in this case it is showing that if the date is 13th and then the day is a Friday under that if these two conditions are met then the system should crash. Something some logic instructions are there which is actually doing this crash operation. So, when this crash will happen only when this can these two conditions are met. So, such kind of the programs are called as the logic bombs. So, so, they are not, uh, logic bombs are not going to be active all the time, only when this trigger point is met. The trigger point can vary, the condition can vary, it can be anything, but it is doing some harmful action if that trigger point is met, that is the uh, logic bomb attack. So, such things can also be written by the uh, insider. So, uh, as a, in, uh, a uh, 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 user we may not get to know such a logic is there inside that uh, application. Only when that uh, uh, logic is actually triggered and then it is executed, you will see the damage at the end. So, uh, you said that uh, malicious software or malware can be uh, written and executed by an insider or an external entity, if so. Uh, particularly for the insider attack, what do I do? How do I actually depend them? So, there are some insider attacks are usually hard to depend or mitigate, but nevertheless, we can take some precautions uh, right at the time of development itself and then uh, make sure that or when the application is uh, put into use. Uh, so, by uh, doing something well, well defined management, this is called, we can do or try to minimize the damage that can happen. So, let us see what are those.
So one of the simple thing that you can do is instead of one system administrator or the manager managing the application, you can hire a bunch of employees and they can have well segregated or well defined roles and they can together manage the application. So you don't depend on only one person. If he, one person, one system administrator, even though maybe he might be knowing that such a logic bomb exists in the application, so he may not reveal that. So if you have multiple people, the chances of that happening is equal. Or if one employee or one system administrator does not notice that uh, uh, this application is doing something uh, like this, the other might actually in notice that. So by doing or segregating by multiple people for maintaining the application, so you minimize the chances of that trigger point, uh, 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 the code the, uh, in the written inside uh, that intelligence block is executed. The other thing that you can do is at the time of the development, if let's say you have two programmers, let's call them as P1 and P2. So what you can do is the code written by P1 can be reviewed by the other programmer P2. So or you can make or tell the programmer P1 to explain what is the logic, whatever is written at this program to programmer P2 and he can check whether this logic is looking okay or this is having some limit code. So this strategy works. So unless P1 and P2, both programmers are uh, having the same malicious intent, this looks okay. Uh, so he can, the programmer P2 can identify. Similarly, whatever the program that is written by uh, the programmer P2 can be reviewed by P1 itself, P1, and then uh, uh, the development can continue. So uh, by doing this code review or walkthrough, you can identify the bugs, the malicious, the logic bombs, or anything that is written inside the program right at the beginning itself. And the other thing that you can do is something called as the least privilege principle. So this we discussed in the last class. What is the least privilege principle says? So any application should have that privilege, which is the bare minimum requirement for that application to run or do its useful job. So if that happens, so unnecessarily by giving the higher privileges, maybe the root privileges to that application, if you don't do that, then you control the damage. So any, for example, if it is asking the logic of that logic bomb is deleting some files. So uh, by giving the, uh, by not giving the uh, root privileges to that application, so even though it is able to delete the file, but not the files control owned by the root or the administrator. So you minimize the damage that happens to your system. So that is another thing that you can do. And then uh, uh, the you can also although this is not a technical thing so uh, any employee the programmer is also an employee if he, our system administrator is also an employee if he or she has some malicious intent their behavior attitude might look something different so if you notice the behavior of these employees prepared if they are doing something to uh, hiding some quality then uh, you can notice that and then uh, you can suspect that probably these employees are not trustworthy and then the code written by them may not be trustworthy as well. So such things also you can employ. So, so far we discussed the, the uh, insider attacks, what the application developers or the administrators can do or uh, by introducing some uh, malicious code inside the application, what harm they can do. So let's turn and look into the what the external entities can do. If someone is uh, uh, outside a hacker or the attacker, what they can do. So we uh, mentioned that the virus is one type of the uh, malicious software. So this virus can be written by and released by an external entity. So what does the virus do? It actually uh, copies itself, replicates itself and goes and sits inside another uh, application and then uh, it runs. So if you collect, you can think of this. So I have one executable program. So this is the uh, malware or the uh, 
virus code and some instructions are there inside so this thing and I have a legitimate application. So this legitimate application may be anything so maybe my word program word application or it could be the power application or any web application anything that you can think of. So what this virus does is it takes and copy of this cell goes and sit inside the this legitimate application. So a part of this legitimate program carries the instructions of the virus. So this virus on its own this cannot run but when this application or program is run so then there are the instructions of the virus are also there as part of this legitimate application they are triggered and they executed they do the harmful activity on the system so that is what the virus can do for you so the instructions of the virus are copied inside a legitimate application and when this legitimate this is an executable program when this application runs the damage is actually done so this virus uh, has got before it actually does the damage it does the, this damage in four stages so the first stage is something called as the uh, dormant stage where the virus itself released by someone outsider is actually being silent in this space it is actually hiding its uh, presence the first phase is you hide your presence so you don't get caught so in that case keep the low profile don't do anything just sit quietly and look for the opportunities to propagate so in this dormant phase it's actually doing that in the second phase something called a propagation phase what it does is it tries to replicate itself and find more number of the applications other applications and also the more number of the other computers to which it can actually propagate so from one computer to another computer to another computer like this it actually propagates itself this is called propagation phase here in this phase also the damage is not done only it is actually replicating and then going from one to another one another system and then the third point is something called as trigger phase where again if you go back to the same example logic application some trigger point it might be an external trigger point or within the system can be some trigger point some action so the virus gets activated and it's actually start doing the that is the starting point where it actually causes the damage so the fourth phase is called as the action phase action phase is the damage phase trigger point trigger phase is the action that is required for the uh, damage to starting of the uh, damage so in the action phase actual damage of the virus happen whatever it might be the malicious logic deleting the file it happens in this uh, fourth phase when this uh, action phase is triggered uh, if it is the uh, malware it is actually deleting the file the deleting operation itself happens in this action phase so these are the four pages in which the virus propagates itself. So that is what the type of the malware, the virus. So if that is the case, how do you actually depend against the virus, this propagation? So what I can do, just like the uh, I wanted to depend the insider attacks, the logic bombs and the backdoors. I can also depend do something for the virus depending against the virus. So one of the common technique that is used for depending against the virus is something called the antivirus. We all know about this. On our systems, we do run antivirus software. So if you run the antivirus software, it will identify such infected files and maybe it can quarantine them or it can delete them from the system and so that your system functions normally. So this antivirus program, antivirus program works using something called as the signatures. It has got inside a database of signatures. So using that signature, it compares whether the for the malware for the virus one, it has got one signature for virus two, it has got another signature for virus three, it has got another signature and so forth. So how many number of the virus are there? 
you might have those many number of the signatures and once an exe one application comes you compare that application whether it contains the uh, the bytes corresponding to this signature if there is a match then you don't allow that program to run or you quarantine whatever action you want to take on that you can take that so that is one well method we will see in a minute how the signatures look like and what are the only so but uh, over a period of time the malware writers particularly the virus writers have also become smart enough they try to hide their identity so so that the antivirus systems can be fooled so they don't detect this as a virus so what they can do they do two simple things one is called as the encryption so you have an executable file let's say this is the infected file the virus is sitting here so this portion is the legitimate code and this portion is the legitimate code and in between you have the malicious code and what the so this exc usually will have something called as the header so this header indicates what all inside their inside this exc so what the malware writers do, do, do over a period of time is take this uh, executable and then do the encryption so uh, you uh, pass on to this encryption algorithm you also probably supply a key and you take the instructions from this uh, uh, file which is also having the uh, malicious content and then encrypt it and create a new exe so in this new exe everything look uh, normal there is nothing uh, because all the instructions are encrypted you attach a new header and also something called a decryption module and then the header so what this uh, encryption is, is once uh, the uh, file if you scan this uh, exe the whatever the signatures that were supposed to look so maybe my signature look like uh, it is um, no, maybe one zero one zero one one this bit sequence is there i'm looking for this bit sequence inside this exe so uh, once it is encrypted the these corresponding whichever bits uh, i am looking here are also encrypted and they are looking uh, random here so uh, now so one zero uh, identify one zero one zero one one sequence in this exe becomes difficult uh, so by doing the encryption you actually hide although in the original file this uh, sequence of bits are there but in this uh, exe you don't see those kinds of bits so that your signature matching fails and then your antivirus don't detect that so but how does the damage is done only when you click on the exe you run this exe uh, this particular program is actually the decryption module sitting here we will do the reverse of that and it can get back this original code. Uh, remember the screening happens at the beginning when you download the exe and now when you run that exe the decryption module will actually turn back and then get the original code and when it is executed uh, uh, that time the damage is done. So by doing this encryption the malware virus writer is actually able to hide the identity of the virus and thereby the antivirus system can be fooled. So this is one well, technique that uh, the uh, uh, virus writers can employ. So uh, such uh, writing, uh, the encryption, uh, the deletion is uh, generally uh, uh, done with something called as the polymorphic or is called as the uh, polymorphic virus so what does the polymer virus means so uh, in the polymorphic virus uh, uh, remember the virus itself is propagating from one uh, system to another system when it is in the uh, initial stage so from the uh, system one what polymorphic virus does is from the system one let's say s1 so when it is going to system s2 you encrypt uh, this exe whatever is there uh, inside uh, this is a malicious virus program 
this virus program you encrypt with uh, let's say k k k1 and then you transfer to system s2 and then when the virus comes here then you take a different key maybe k2 and encrypt this file and then you transfer to system s3 and the process can go on so every time the virus uh, is uh, the exe correspond that virus screen since it is encrypted with a different key it look different so the, the, the originally it is the same exe file but it is having a different kind of the structure so such kind of the viruses are is are called as a polymorphic virus it is say polymorphism means it is in the many format so virus is one but it is having many variants so by doing that it is actually ending so if i have the sequence the same signature sequence 101011 this is the signature corresponding this virus so when i look at this i might find to clear when it is running on this system but when i look at when i see in this system so since it is encrypted with the key so that sequence 101011 may not be seen in the variant which is there in the s2 the same thing happens when it is the same virus is there in the s3 as well so by doing this every time it looks different so the, now the antivirus program has got a great challenge uh, to in identifying it is the same virus but it is appearing in different different formats maybe it potentially use a different encryption algorithm as well every time it encrypted it encrypted with a different variant and using a different key so by doing this it's actually hiding its presence so this is another technique in which the attackers can actually hide the identity of the virus the third technique is something called as the metamorphic virus metamorphism and polymorphism are sometimes used interchangeably but in pure uh, terms it, they are not identical polymorphism is using a dip possibly a different key and encryption algorithm to encrypt the virus but metamorphic virus is actually using some other obfuscation techniques encryption is also an obfuscation techniques i'll just give a simple uh, example let's say i have one uh, function let me call it as fun and it is uh, taking maybe uh, two variable int a int b and then uh, all that i am doing is i am declaring a variable in c and c is equal to a plus b and then uh, return c this is the uh, function uh, addition of two numbers is the function of this uh, function fun uh, uh, what i can do is uh, i when i compile this program they, there are uh, some set of instructions that get uh, generated and uh, for the time being assume this is a malicious code and uh, although this is not a malicious code hypothetically let's assume this is a malicious code but if i am the writer i want to uh, uh, hide the identity of this one so i don't want uh, the function name to be revealed or what instructions it is doing the addition operation i don't want to reveal that so what i can do is i can possibly twist the Uh, uh, the code inside this function and then make it look like something really different maybe what i can do so uh, let's see uh, then is there int a int b and then uh, so i have uh, a variable int c in addition to that i declare another variable d and then maybe e so what i do is initially i copy d is equal to a this is my instruction and then i take e is equal to b and then c is equal to d plus e i will intend to do addition of the a and b but instead of doing directly doing a and b what i am doing is i am introducing couple of variables and then i am copying the a and b to these variables and then doing the addition and then i at the end i might return the see although these two programs are doing the same thing but the uh, number of uh, uh, statements inside this function are not the uh, same there are more number of the instruction uh, statement inside the uh, second variant than the first one 
so by doing so they can be so you can have a series of such assignment i might declare 10 more variables and then first time i copy a to d and d to some another variable yap and f to g something like that and finally when i want to add at the end of this i might say c is equal to uh, p plus q something like that so by doing this the whatever the sequence of bit that you are looking for in the signature antivirus signature but its job becomes hard because now the code is not looking the same so if the virus is actually doing this kind of thing for hiding it and see that kind of virus is called as a metamorphic virus so it's actually using some kind of the obfuscation technique to hide its entity so uh, although polymorphic and metamorphic viruses are very common nowadays uh, they are antivirus uh, you know, software developers are also doing some uh, things to uh, identify such uh, viruses so as i said they use the signatures this signatures come in different formats so uh, one of the simple thing is you require you look for some bit sequence so but the way signature themselves appear can uh, there are three kind, different kinds of the signatures one is something called as the in order signature so in order signature means my signature antivirus uh, the uh, virus detection signature let's say look i am looking for a, a bit sequence which are looking like this i first i require 1010 this is my first portion the second portion i might require 10001 this is my second sequence and then the third sequence might look like 0101 something like this when i see these three bit sequences in order so i have an executable program first i see 1010 somewhere and second portion i see 1 ko 000 and 1 and then third i see 0101 then i detect it as a virus this is called in sequence so i am having an exe i go from the beginning to the end of the exe if this bit sequence is seen in that exe then i detect that as a virus this is one uh, kind of the signature that it can have this is called in order signature so the, the sequence of bits should appear in that in this order only first i should see 1010 second i should see a 1001 and then third i should see 0101 the second category uh, of signature are called something called conjunction signature so the difference is i might still look at the same sequence but the order does not matter i should see one uh, all that i should see is 1001 and then 1010 and 0101 this is also okay me so all that has happened is the first bunch of sequence bits that i wanted to shift it here and the second uh, come here so same three co sequence of bit i am looking for but i am not enforcing that they should appear in order so any order is okay as long as they appear together it is fine with me such signatures are called as the conjunction signature this is antivirus signatures the third category of signature is something called the probabilistic signature so probability signature also have the same bit sequence but what i am doing is i say that if only the bit sequence 1010 appear although i require three of them with the probability let's say 0.25 this is virus v1 i predict this with the 0.25 probability this is probability if the uh, uh, the exe has the sequence 1010 and also 1001 then with probability let's say 0.6 i am predicting this as a virus v1 so if all three of them appear together then with probability 1 maybe i am declaring that as the virus v1 so depending upon how much portion overlap is there between the bit sequences of the executable that you are verifying and then the bit sequence of the signature that you have on that basis i am assigning certain probability with that probability i am saying that whether this is virus v1 v2 or any other other so such signatures if you have that kind of signatures are called as the probabilistic signatures 
So let me go again. In the order signature, wants you to the signature, the whatever bit sequence I am looking for, they should appear in in one after the other. In conjunction signature, I am not worried about the order of the bit sequence, but only the combination. As long as they appear in some order, I am okay with that. And the third is in the probabilistic signature. Uh, whether the only one bit sequence bunch is matching, the second one and two are matching, or only two and three are matching, whatever might be bit sequence are matching, based on that I am assigning some probability. Such signatures are called as a probabilistic signatures. They do use some kind of the uh, obfuscation techniques, and there are some detection methods, particularly the signatures. The antivirus signatures can be of the format. So uh, the difference between virus and worm is the uh, same thing. So uh, virus is actually uh, copying itself to another application. Worm is an independent uh, program; it can run on its own. Uh, 